welcome back everybody for another candle keep mystery now this one here you can see at the top is for second level characters and it is titled mass froth's mighty digressions so they tell you that just a few days ago this book was brought to candle keep and what nobody knows at the time is that this book is actually a monster in disguise and it's going to attack anyone that tries to read it this has also recently happened with a few other books that have recently been brought to Candle Keep. So we'll see how that ties into other information further along. So of course, like anything else in the Candle Keep Mysteries, the players have to first find the book. DM could come up with whatever reason he or she wanted, wouldn't matter, but they give you a few ideas right here. Maybe the players go to the library looking for information about the magic, the weave, lycanthropy, demon lords, whatever that may be. Then they give you a little book description. They tell you on the outside there's some nice handwriting, but on the inside it's really messy. And as you see up here, it really looks like a weathered book. Looks like the binding's about to come apart. Look at those pages. So looks like it's pretty old and tattered, but it is all still there together. They tell you that on the inside, it's a collection of essays about divinity, denizens of the multiverse, nature of magic, and so on down the line. So there are some helpful things inside of it. If characters find it and actually read some of it, it'll tell them that all magic depends on the weave and how there's an interface <clears throat> between the weave and the caster. All this is governed by Mistra. You probably know of Mistra right there. Even talks about how there could be a huge amount of destruction if any of it's used inappropriately and so on down the line. Talks a little about Malar and how it believes that Malar is responsible for all lycanthropy, but considering some like werebears are good, that's probably not accurate right there. Talks about the Abyss and some of these demon lords with so DM. As you read some of this information, whatever one they may be interested in, read some of this information and then look at this. Suddenly the book transforms and attacks. So they're probably not going to be expecting that. So what has this book suddenly changed into? An all-new creature right here called a Gingwatsum. That one's a mouthful. Where do they come up with these names? I don't know. But notice this is an unusual form of life created by spell or ritual. And notice how it's actually a spirit of energy from the ethereal plane. So they tell you that it's true form. You've seen it in the book form. But it's true form is basically a ball of light three feet in diameter. So whenever some caster summons this Ging Watson, it will telepathically obey their commands best it can. Now, once it's summoned, notice it can assume two other forms. One could be a tiny non-magical object. In other words, a book. So that gets us started there. It could also assume another small form like that of maybe a mouse or a bat or something such as that right there. We'll see how that ties in with other things further along. So they tell you that when this thing transforms from the book to its true form, it's going to attack. And it uses its attack primarily in the form of an energy drain. It needs to feed off the energy of life forms to survive. And that's why this one is suddenly transformed. It was told to remain in the form of this book by who summoned it. We'll see why further along. But the thing gets hungry and eventually it has to change and attack. Now look at this attack. They tell you that this attack will do when it hits 4d6 plus 2 necrotic damage. Now remember this is against level 2 players. I think it's pretty harsh considering these are going to be level 2 characters. So sometimes I don't know where they come up with some of these ideas right here. But they tell you it can also change into a bat if it wants. And this one right here will fight until it's destroyed because it's very hungry. A lot of time, like other creatures that run away, and maybe this one's a bat would fly away, but not this one. And what's funny is it's attacking, it sends telepathic messages that say, feed me, need life. So maybe they'll give some characters some clues as to what's going on with this creature. Now, where did this creature that appeared as a book come from? It was created by Jackalware named Corvala. Now, Corvala here knows a ritual on how to summon these creatures, and it was taught how to do this by its former leader, a Lamia named Nadalia. So this individual here, Corvala, is the current leader of a gang of jackalwares. And what they're doing, they actually have three valuable books. But instead of selling the three valuable books, they summon these creatures, 
have them change into the form of the book so it looks like an exact duplicate and then they sell it so basically what they're doing are selling copies of the valuable books but of course they never give up the valuable books so they can just keep re reselling them making more money now why are they doing this it's not just simply out of greed their former leader this Lamia right here was killed so what they're trying to do is raise enough gold to resurrect this individual. That's the background behind all of this. So there they mention this in the little writing right here. They're trying to get up enough gold. They need a thousand gold pieces to resurrect their former leader. So they're having these little creatures, these Ging Watson, change into these valuable books. And then what they didn't think of, well, these things are going to eventually get hungry, change back. They're going to attack people. And of course, somebody at Candlekeep is going to wonder what's happening. Why is all this going on? So, of course, the players have to figure out the mystery behind these monstrous books. They tell you that if they go to Candlekeep and talk to the sages there, they'll give them some information. They'll tell them that this is the third book that is transformed into this strange monster. In addition to the Mass Frost book, it's happened with two others. One called Dark Hunger, one called Fallen, looks like Tethermar, hard to pronounce right there. So these three books will be a clue later when the individuals uh, find these jackal wares. So all three books were used as payment to gain entrance into Candlekeep. Evidently, these guys keep really good records. They know who donated these books, and they tell the players who they are and where to find them. So in addition to telling them who they need to look for, who donated these books, they also tell the players that if you can solve this mystery, we'll give you this magical helm of comprehending languages. So that'll be their payment for all of this. So of course the players want to go and question who donated these books. So one of them they've already found. Now with one of the other books, they tell you it came from this 26-year-old human, and they give us some background information, good for them, but they tell you this individual will be happy to talk to them, and they will be surprised to know that that book changed into a monster. They didn't have any idea that it was actually like that. So they will tell the players 10 days ago, they bought this book from a market stall in the wide. That's a marketplace over at Baldar's Gate. They'll tell you that they remember in the name of the market stall, it had the name Dune in it. So that'll give them a very good clue for finding whoever it was originally sold this book. So this person arrived at Candlekeep five days ago and so on down the line. Here's one of the other individuals who sold one of these books. Now this individual right here is a tiefling knight and they tell you has a constant scowl on their face and they're not very friendly. But with a little charisma save or some persistence, the individual will talk to them. So they'll tell them right here that 13 days ago they arrived and they're actually looking for this individual called, it looks like Hadar. That's what they were reading the book about and so on. So they donated the book, but they tell them too, they got it from a market stall, again over at Baldar's Gate in a not so friendly part of town. So the players are picking up on this. You know, they got sort of a poor criminal part of town. And in the name of the market, it has Dune in it. I should say in the market, but the particular bookseller has Dune in the name. So they're picking up these clues right here. So this individual gives them some other information right here. Talks about uh, revealing its true form and so on down the line. So there's a, some useful information given by these two individuals. So, of course, the players have to leave Candlekeep and go to Baldar's Gate. And they tell you it's going to be a five-day travel. Well, along the way, there are some bandits that are going to attack them. They're going to ambush them. And look what they're looking for, rare books and other valuables. So not what you would usually expect from bandits. <laughs> now, what's going on right here? This looter is a were-rat. You can see it looks like Mush, Mushika is the name. This were-rat and three giant rats are going to attack. This individual is a former member of the Thieves Guild and so on. And if the giant rats are killed and this individual is taken down to half hit points, it'll try and run away if it can. If it gets away, they're going to see this individual again. Otherwise, maybe they kill it outright. 
So after this ambush, they'll eventually get to the wide, which is the name of this marketplace in Baldar's Gate. So they tell you that this area is well lit, it's very nice, luxurious, expensive as far as restaurants and so on. But of course, the poor people can come into this area during the daytime, but at night they're going to have to leave if they don't have a special token that allows them to be there. So they tell you that in this market, it's evidently very big. Look at this, almost anything can be found here. So that gives them a good clue as to what they could find if they want more than just books. They tell you that corruption and bribes are common here. So that's something that they could use to their advantage. There's a strong watch here. There's 10 veterans that keep the peace. And since they're just second level characters, it's going to be tough if they clash with them. Finding the actual stall of the bookseller. Now notice right up here where they give you a picture. Here's a couple of individuals. Here's all their books for sale. And look at that. Dune is in the name of this shopkeeper, just as they were told by one of the individuals who brought the book to Candlekeep. So here they can find the stall. They can speak to these individuals right here. They can find this bookstore and notice with a very, looks like reasonable check, a DC 10 charisma score. They can even ask around if they need to, to get a little bit more information. But eventually they're going to find this stall and they tell you there's other things in the area. Why they bother to tell you there's a bakery, an antique shop, and so on down the line, don't know. But notice they can even purchase scrolls. They said you can find just about anything here, so that's reasonable. But what's going on at this Amber Dune Books? Again, that Dune was the key word right there. So they'll be able to quickly see this is sort of a common looking bookstore. A lot of them aren't that expensive, but there are a few rare ones, right? Notice again, these aren't the originals right here. So that's what they've been selling. They'll tell you that if the players sit back and watch, they'll notice a couple of individuals are always there. And again, these are actually jackal wares in disguise. So there's always two of them here. They tell you that they work in four hour shifts and this current leader Corvala comes by every two hours to check up on them. So if the players want, they can sit back and observe and go right up to them and talk to them, watch them later. And if they want, they can try and follow two of these individuals as they leave the bookstore. We'll notice with a certain little DC check right here, they might be able to question individuals and determine whether they're being truthful or not. And if they determine that this Corvall is not telling the truth, she'll actually invite them back to their hideout and talk to them some more peacefully. <clears throat> so these jackalwares are actually relatively friendly. They're highly suspicious, but as long as the players don't really act aggressive, they can actually get some information from them. But if they want to follow them, they tell you right here, the group will have to make a DC 13 dexterity check to not be noticed. And if they are, of course, the jack are going to pick up on this. So let's say they follow them back with a little stealth check right here. Or they're actually nice to the current leader and want more information. That individual will invite them back. Now, of course, they may not realize where they're going to. And of course, they're probably going to suspect that it's probably a trap. But actually, as long as they're polite, it's not actually uh, needing to go that way. So they tell you that back here at their hideout, there's actually seven jackal wares. So again, level two characters would find a difficult time beating these jackal wares, plus all their little other helpers that are in this hideout. So being good negotiators could definitely be beneficial to them. So they give you a little description on these seven jackal wares, not much of importance right there. And they talk a little about role playing them. Notice again right here, they're not hostile unless they're provoked. If they want to, they'll use their little sleep gaze right here. They tell you it's a last resort, so they don't just go immediately to it. So if they can talk to the players and hopefully end all this peacefully, that's what they'd like. Because you got to remember their primary goal isn't selling these fake books for gold. They want to resurrect their dead leader. If they get into a lot of combat and they're dead, they can't do that. So that's why they act friendly. So they mentioned a little about the leader, 32-year-old Jack Aware. So here's a picture of this individual right here, and they tell you that they're tall and imposing. They give you some information, and this is the one who knows the ritual and how to create these Ging Watsums, which they're telling to pose as these books, which are valuable, and then selling these copies. So that's how they're really making their money. 
So they give you some information right here on that individual. And again, there's that picture. They mention Blackgate right here. So they talk about this neighborhood is on the north side of the town right here, not far from the market. Real poor part of town. Huts, tents, things like that are what you're going to see. So they mention Were Rat's Revenge right here. If the characters allowed that Were Rat that ambushed them earlier, it will find them eventually wandering around this area somewhere and attack along with a swarm of rats and a couple of human thugs as helpers. So again, that were rat that ambushed him on the way was looking to kill people or at the very least steal valuable books from them and then sell them to these jackal wares. That's where all this is coming from. But this individual has no interest in what the jackal wares really want. It's just looking to make gold and such right here and whatever else it can find. So if they didn't kill that were rat the first time, they're going to have to face it again along with a couple of human thugs. I'll make it a little bit tougher. But let's say they are able to be stealthy and follow the jack wares to their hideout, or if they just spoke to this Corvala, noticed deceit, confronted them, and the individual invited them back. So they tell you that their hideout's a hovel, right? Very poor little place right here. And they mention the time of day. So from all of the daylight hours, at least two of those jack wares are at the bookstore selling those fake books that change into those uh, shape-shifting creatures right there every time they can to raise money. But they mention some of these common places, and they've got a map here in just a second that shows you these different areas like A1, A4, and they tell you what you'll find in each one here, and they do the same thing in the next one. So they mention the little friendly conversation. So if Corvala right up here invited the individuals back to their hideout to discuss what's going on with these books, that's one option right there. So there's the hideout. You can see just a few rooms, but notice there's a little hidden stairwell that goes down to A6 in the basement. The players are going to need to find that area. So they tell you that if they arrive under friendly terms, the jackalwares are uncomfortable, and of course they're going to be suspicious. they got weapons nearby, but they're not going to be hostile unless the player characters attack. On the subject of the monstrous books, None of the jack wares will speak to them except for Carvala. So if the players ask any of these other seven about these books, they're going to say, look, you have to speak to Corvala about that. They mention foes right here. Now, if the player characters attack, the jack wares will stand their ground. They like to gang up on the players one at a time and kill them off as quickly as they can that way. But if the jack wares are taken down below half their hit points, looks like they might lose, they will actually surrender because, again, they don't want to die because their primary goal is to get enough gold to resurrect that leader, that Lamia. So they mention the hideout lake location. So here they tell you what's in these six little rooms, not much going on. There's a common room, chairs, mugs, a rug, and so on down the line. Now notice the rug on the floor here is a rug of smothering. It is friendly to the jackal wares. It will obey their commands and attack if it needs to. And if the players enter here when there are no jackal wares present, it will attack on its own. So it's hungry. It will go after them. So they mention here, noise from this room will attract one of the other jackal wares in A2 coming in with a scimitar. So A2 is the kitchen, pots and pans and other things like you would expect. It actually says there are two jack wares right here. They're just chatting at the time, but again, they hear noise. Looks like one of them's going to run into A1. A3 right here, a little dormitory. So they tell you you might find an individual, another jack aware taking a nap. And if they enter here stealthily, they could actually slip past this individual with a nice relatively low stealth check. So they tell you that combat in this room alerts Zan from A5. We'll get to that one in a second. A4 is Carvala's office. That's the current leader. So they tell you there's quill, ink, journal, and a couple of swords on the wall. So maybe Corvala came back with them. So they could walk into this area or one of the others and have a nice peaceful talk. Or if they were to come into this area uninvited, they might actually surprise the leader here. So if they do, they'll find the individual sitting at the desk reading. Won't be uh, expecting them most of the time. But again, if they stealthily come in, they might surprise them. If they were invited in, not a problem there. Now the swords on the wall 
are actually two of these other summoned creatures, those Ging Watsums. Now again, remember these things do 4d6 plus 2 necrotic damage on a hit, and these are level 2 players. So, you know, coming in with the Jackalwares friendly may be just about their only option of actually completing this quest. Because you figured that between all these Jackalwares and what are the creatures uh, like that rug, that could be very tough for them to survive. So in this area, they tell you that if needed, those King Watson, which are posing as swords, will attack right there. They can change into bats if they want. There's a journal on this individual's desk that mentions sales that they've had from their little store. And look at what's in that sales book, the three books that changed into these magical creatures. So if the players find this and they don't already know what's going on, they'll definitely figure it out there. But again, if they're friendly, Corvala will actually explain their true motives. This leader will actually tell them they're just trying to raise money to resurrect their foreign leader. And if this individual is questioned about that ritual to summon these creatures, she'll tell them a lie. She'll say she's under the effects of a Gia spell and can't share the spell. So if the players want to get this spell from her, it's not going to happen easily. Probably not at all. And that's probably the best thing for the DM right here. If these individuals in the uh, party can start summoning these creatures, well, that's sort of uh, something a bit too powerful. At least make it a higher level spell, or don't give it to them at all. Whatever the DM thinks is best. But this individual, Corvala, will tell them that these summoned creatures can summon, excuse me, can transform into two forms. And of course, one being a tiny beast, the other an object like a book. So they'll tell them here they're not really bright, but they will obey commands. They will stay in book form as long as they can, but eventually they're going to have to feed on the energy of something which is alive. And that's what's causing them to eventually break their command and change from a book in the library and attack somebody. Corvala will tell them that eight of these Ging Watsons have been created so far. Six disguised as books, two currently right here in the room, as we mentioned, appearing as swords. Corvala never thought about them ending up in Candlekeep and attacking somebody, but considering how close Candlekeep is, that's a little bit short-sighted right there. As reparations, she's willing to surrender the three original versions of those books. So again, the party could actually solve all this peacefully if they want, but again, fighting is another option too. So they mentioned the storage room at A5. There's some trunks and bookshelves here. So they'll tell you that there's a jackalware in this area here. And one of the trunks is actually a mimic. So it'll attack anybody that touches it. There is another storage trunk that's got 50 gold inside of it. So they could actually come out with a few gold pieces right there. And then further on to A6. This is the hidden vault area. So they'll tell you this is a narrow descending passageway, ends in a circular chamber with two trunks that have padlock, padlocks on them. Now Corvala has the keys. So again, this could be solved peacefully. Maybe they kill Corvala and take the keys. If they don't have the keys, they might could pick the lock, gonna take a DC 15 dex check, or with a blunt weapon like a hammer with a DC 17 strength check, they might could bash it off. They tell you they won't be able to magically look inside of the trunks. So they're going to need to get inside of them one way or another. Trunk 1 has the dried heart of the leader that died. That's the one they're trying to resurrect. There's also 450 gold. So they're about halfway to their 1,000 gold piece, piece level that'll let them get enough money for a resurrection spell. Trunk 2 has six books, and look at that. Three of them are those originals that they're looking for right there. So a few others in there with them. Resolving the mystery. So again, they need to get these original versions. They might have done this peacefully. Again, the leader didn't realize they were going to be attacking people, so they could solve this peacefully, get the books, and return them back to Candlekeep. Or, of course, all this could go through bloodshed, and that's what they mentioned right here. So if they want to resolve the mystery through combat, they can do that right there. Kill all these jackalwares and all the other creatures in here if they can. Find the keys, get to this hidden area, unlock those trunks, and again, find what's inside. They can find these books and return them right back to Candlekeep. That's one way to solve it there. Now again, the leader will just surrender 
those books, if asked right there. It could be through peaceful negotiation right here. Or again, if the Jackawares are taken down, say, below half their hit points, they'd rather surrender and give up the books because their true goal is to bring back their leader. And then again, negotiations, the individuals in the party could give them the remaining gold that they need to resurrect their leader, and then they'd happily give up the books because that's what all this is about. So in conclusion right here, whether they do it through battle, negotiations, or just peacefully talking to the leader, they get the books, they have to bring them back to Candlekeep. They vowed, of course, will keep their word and give the party that helm of comprehend languages. So they tell you there's some other ways that this could all wrap up too. Characters who successfully negotiate with the Jackaware pack will gain the support of Corvala, all the other Jackawares, and then once they've resurrected that former leader, the Lamia, they'll all be allies. So if they do this peacefully, they can actually gain some valuable allies here. If they fought the Jackawares but didn't kill them all, well, those could individuals could come back to attack them later. So the DM can use that in any way they want and have some fun with that. So there's the second adventure in the Candlekeep Mysteries. And again, when you consider how powerful some of these individuals are, like these uh, summoned creatures that can transform doing 46 damage and then seven jackal wares, a rug of smothering, looks like the characters may need to do this peacefully. So adjust this as DM any way that you see fit. Until next time, good luck and good gaming.